in regards to Macro. Back to the sponsor is Robert Ellis. Hi, I'm my name is Sorensen. I'm a marine biology major, and I, as you said, I did my project on aquaponics. So, imagine if you will, you're spending a day at the beach, and you go swimming out in the water. After a while, you realize you're starting to get further and further away from the shore. You're caught in a riptide. Now, which would you rather have at your side? An oceanographer explained that, well, you shouldn't be saying riptide. It's more accurate to say current, because it's not technically a tide, and here's why. Or would you rather have a lifeguard next to you, reminding you to swim parallel to the shore, and you'll soon be free of it, of the riptide current. <laughs> See, it's no secret that the world is not in a great shape right now in many different ways. And while it is very important to understand the issues we are facing and why we are facing them, I would argue that it's just as important, if not maybe a little more important, to discuss solutions to some of these many problems. One such solution that to a few of the problems we are facing, in my opinion, is aquaponics. So today I'm going to explain what aquaponics is, and then discuss how we're about testing one of the benefits of aquaponics over traditional farming. Aquaponics is a combination of soilless farming, hydroponics, and fish farming aquaculture. To make it simple, aquaponics is the use of fish wastewater pumped through the roots of plants. The roots clean the water, and the water is returned to the container of fish. This is actually the aquaponics system I built with my father a few years ago. So, as you can see, so down here, in this container, uh, he decided to go with goldfish and koi. Uh, the water is pumped up through the spray bar, and as it fills the container, the roots take out the nutrients, clean it, so that when it drains back down, it's clean for the fish. And the thing that makes the wastewater able to be absorbed and cleaned by the roots is a plant, uh, by the plants is a process called nitrification cycle. This is when ammonia from the fish waste gets converted by bacteria into nitrite, and then further bacteria convert the nitrite into nitrates. Both ammonia and nitrite are very toxic, but nitrate is only toxic in high doses, and it is the nitrate that the plants are able to take up with their roots as fertilizer. Um, thus removing it from the water and making the water clean for the fish. Because of this process, you can raise both plants and fish in one complete system. And with only a few rare exceptions, any crop can be grown in a system like this. And because the water is so clean, the fish grow to large sizes and are very healthy. So, there are many benefits of aquaponics, but for my experiment, I decided to test the claim. Aquaponics can provide better growth rates over traditional farming. And I decided to test this using four different commonly homegrown plants that all have very different needs. Jalapeno, strawberry, sweet basil, and peppermint. Last fall, I restarted the school's aquaponics system. Uh, in my case, I'm using goldfish for the fish, but we also received tilapia fry from a nearby high school that is doing a breeding program. Uh, once they're a bit older, I will be adding, adding them to the system so we can also be demonstrating that you can also grow edible fish. Unfortunately, goldfish are not very good eats. <laughs> so, and as you can see, so there's a pump down here that pumps up the wastewater through to the spray bars. They both grow beds. And then the plants, and just like the one system I built for my father, is the uh, Grow beds full up, fill up, the roots take out the nitrates, and it's pumped back and returned to the fish. Um, so, uh, after letting the system go through the nitrogen cycle, I added a set of plants to the system so we can so they can just and acclimate to being uh, as part of the aquaponics system. Um, at the beginning of January, I added an identical set of plants soil, with uh, one set being in plain soil, uh, peat moss and perlite. Uh, that's the ones in the unmarked uh, containers. Uh, as you can see, so here I have strawberry, 
There's the peppermint, there's another strawberry plant, sweet basil, and then jalapeno. And then this would be my control group. The other experiment group is the same set of plants in a formulated fertilizer actually developed by our own horticultural department. So again, here is, there are the labeled ones. So here is strawberries, peppermint, sweet basil, and jalapeno. And uh, both sets of plants that were in soil were watered using just uh, general tap water. And then every week I would take growth measurements by measuring the highest point of new growth for each of the plants, with the exception of the uh, peppermint, which I measured dimensionally just due to the nature of how it grew. So this is the uh, planted ones. This is right again experiment. Here they are at the end of the experiment. So, uh, if you, you might notice that the uh, sweet basil in this one actually died. I'll get to why. <laughs> later. Um, actually, soon after the experiment ended, I stopped taking measurements. Unfortunately, the sweet basil and the plain soil also died. So, here is the aquaponic system at the beginning of the experiment. Here is the peppermint, the jalapeno. Those on the side here, those are the sweet basil, and those are strawberry at the top. And so at the end of my experiment, that is, so as you can see here, the peppermint, the jalapeno plant. Uh, you can't, because it's so big, you can't get behind it. So <laughs> here are the strawberries, and also, unfortunately, in my system, all the uh, sweet basil dies. Again, I'll get to that in a little bit. So, here is the growth rates for, uh, this is for the peppermint, so the blue is the aquaponics, fertilizer, and the plant soil. So everything was compared in relation to plant soil with the fertilizer uh, from 438.5% better over the plant soil, while the aquaponics only did 214.6% better. And again, this is in centimeters cubed because I had to measure dimensionally. Uh, that sudden drop right there in the aquaponics is because at that point it was growing so well that it was starting to grow into the other plants, and so I actually had to turn it back. So that's why you <laughs> didn't want to take over my system. So here we are with the sweet basils, uh, as you can see. So that again, this is height and centimeters. Um, it's a, so blue with the aquaponics fertilizer plain soil. Um, you can see those very sun dips. Um, I consulted with the horticulture uh, teachers, and right now the running theory is is that all of the sweet basil plants had root rot, which they could only have gotten from the farm that they came from. <coughs> so, fortunately for me, they're dead. It has nothing to do with my experiment. <laughs> I just got them from a bad farm. But before they all got it, um, the fertilizer outperformed, outperformed the plant soil by 203.8, while the aquaponics did actually only 118.9% better. Actually, as for the strawberries, with, as you can see, the blue lines being aquaponics, the reds and the fertilizer yields plant soil, um, actually, the fertilizer only did 142.1% better plant soil. Well, the aquaponics did 360.5% better over plant soil. And then the greatest success so far is the jalapeno. Uh, jalapeno did 230% in fertilizer better over plant soil. Well, the aquaponics actually did 720.8% better than just the plant soil. The running theory for why it did so well is because jalapenos are warm weather plants. And because I started this experiment in the winter, as far as the plants in the soil knew, it's cold. So they slowed down the growth rate. But because in my system, I heated the water for the sake of the fish, as far as the jalapeno in the system knew, it's nice, great, warm weather. So he grew and kept growing. He never slowed down. So this lends to the idea that you can grow year round warm weather crops. 
And so, based on these results, we see that the two plants that actually produced edible vegetation, strawberries and the peppermint, did better growth-wise. And this is great news in growing your own food. This shows that it's worth your time and investment to switch to growing crops like these and crops and aquaponics instead of traditional farming. But let's not forget that with aquaponics, you're growing two crops, vegetation and fish. Another key thing about aquaponics is that it does not require being located with ideal soil and other conditions that traditional farming needs. Aquaponics can be set up in any location, even indoors, provided you have adequate lighting. And it also can be built at any scale, not only small backyard systems like the ones I've shown you, but also in large-scale production farms. Now, you might be saying to yourself, I'm not old McDonald. I do not have a farm, E-I-E-I-O. I am merely Jack and Jane Q student. Why should I care about new farming techniques? And here's why. We cannot just ignore the multitude of issues we're facing today. Solutions need to be discussed. Now, you don't have to make huge changes in your life. Maybe just start buying fish from sustainable sources and encourage water conservation measures. Ideally, one day we'll transition to aquaponics instead of traditional farming. Hopefully, for the sake of the earth and every human on it, that future comes sooner rather than later. Thank you. Time for questions. I have uh, two questions that go to be similar. Uh, I was wondering what type of soil we use in the aquaponics, and I can tell that it wasn't traditional. It's kind of like in green light. So, very good question. So this isn't <coughs> soil because it's soilless farming. So, but they do kind of need some at least in this design, they do need some kind of media to grow in. So this is actually a baked clay beets, very porous. So the bacteria that are needed in the nitrogen cycle can grow inside this media. Um, so this is the style. Uh, the one I worked with my father. Is large scale, these are all wraps. So that's another style. That's actually the most commonly used in like a large scale. They mostly use like a wrap system because then you can like change the current to like automate it. So but yeah, no, just for the sake of how we did it, we used baked clay beads. And then the other question? The second one was, what did you feed the fish? Oh, uh, for our experiment, I just used uh, Common uh, store-bought fish food. I actually got it from the uh, uh, marine science department, the aquarium sciences. So standard, everyday fish food. Uh, in some systems, I've heard that you they think like tail for some fish, uh, not necessarily goldfish or tilapia. Uh, people have just thrown them table scraps. Uh, some of the leftover uh, vegetation from that they're growing, uh, they can go. They can feed that to the fish. Um, but just for our sake of our experiment, we just use pond fish food. Um, your plants that you grew in the dirt and the fertilizer, you said you watered them with tap water? Yeah, <coughs> hose water. Hose, yeah. yeah. I wonder if you, you know, this is another control, you can use some of the water from your system because True. you don't know if it's the dirt or the water. Uh, well, actually, I'm fairly certain, at least from, uh, it's, the same water, I mean, this is also uh, hose water when I just filled it up. So this isn't some special water that I used for this. So they got the same water. It's just the fact that in this system, it's fish waste water. So that adds that benefit to it. I think it the chlorine in it. Uh, well, at least, for, in this. at least in the fish, we because they have the fish, you got to take care of it. You got to worry about that. We use a dechlorinator right. when we have that water. So the other one's got Certainly could benefit. My next question is, how much does like one of these home setups cost to set up? Okay, well, I will actually know. Um, this one I built for, for my dad. Um, this is all, as you see, this is basically just a 55 gallon storage container. There's a lid. This is a mixing tray. That's what all this is. Uh, actually, the most expensive part was just the clay beads. It was just 
giant bat and only one giant bag. Um, so if you're doing like small scale home ones, it's um, a little over a hundred. Just because again, the most expensive part was this. The TBC was expensive. The cement mixing tray was cheap, and this is again this big plastic is that shipping container or storage container. Um, as for the one the OCC has, I actually don't know. This is actually donated, um, so I don't know what the cost of that is. But if you're talking small scale home ones like the one I built for my father, not really a whole lot expensive. And I have a question about the couple of crops that were grown in fertilizer that were actually more successful than the aquaponics. Yes. Do we know why that was? Um. Well. Well, for as long as, in the case of the sweet basil. Uh, oh no, not the sweet basil because yeah, I was talking about the sweet basil. Um, but the other one, oh, I forgot. Was it the mint? Peppermint. The peppermint. peppermint. Yeah. Yeah, peppermint did better. Um, it could have just been that it liked the fertilizer a bit better. Um, I do know, in the sake of the peppermint, also the fact that I trimmed back the last oh. thing out like that, so that could have <laughs> absolutely that could have affected how. It's maximum potential because uh, they turned it back. But um, there could be so many other reasons. Uh, could be the pH. I did know uh, for my system, one of the biggest headaches I had to continually fight was the pH. That was also why you can see the strawberries are a bit more yellow, lighter green because they like a 6.5, but due to the hardness of the tap water I was using the system, uh, it kept buffering it up into the high 7s. Well, you can see, and these were a nice dark green, so that could have been part of the uh, mixture, and so it, you know, they don't have to worry about pH as much. So. I was just wondering if certain insects were attracted to this, and if so, did you use at any time, whether this green or small or organic? So, very interestingly enough, um, as for uh, just so, um, uh, just so, you guys know. so this is on a table over in the Corpus Department. Actually, right next to it, over here on the screen, is the aquaponic system. So that way, the both systems are getting similar like of each other. But for the planted ones, I actually did have an issue with aphids. But for the longest time, for whatever reason, I didn't have an issue at all. Dog fox. For some reason, the aphids never touched it until uh, actually a couple weeks ago. And then I started having an issue. Um, one of the, you should say, benefits of aquaponics is you can't really use pesticides because you got to think of the fish. Pesticides in there, you're going to kill the fish and also very likely all the good bacteria that's running in there. So with this, if I were to have a choice, I'd rather get a bunch of lay bugs and have them eat all the aphids. So that's one of the benefits because you can say organic farming. Never, you just can't use pesticides in a system like this. So that's another one of the uh, benefits being claimed by aquaponics is you can't use pesticides. And just for whatever reason, uh, up until very recently, I just weren't really interested in my plants. So that could be used for further research on why, but uh, that's for another study. <laughs> Uh, very good question. So, another. Let's see if I can go back to the one. So, right here. So, with spacing, that's a big uh, thing you got to take consideration with traditional farming because you got to make sure the roots have their space to grow because you don't want them to compete. But you don't really need to worry about that so much with aquaponics. You can grow more plants in a small area with aquaponics than if, than if you had traditional farming. So, um, and I can let you know through, uh, every week I did a uh, nitrate test. Um, there was absolutely, because goldfish are <coughs> disgusting, dirty fish, there was no shortage of nutrients. So these plants had 
plenty of nitrates to grow, and especially if you see that jalapeno. Um, so uh, competition isn't really a factor in aquaponics as much as it is in the traditional farming. So I, actually, I think we probably have time for one last quick question, and then we're going to have to wrap up. So. Okay, so going on from that last question, actually, with your is something like having them contained individually going to affect this, the extent to which they can grow because they're not having as much space, irrespective of competition? Um, absolutely. When um, at, when you get to like much larger scale, like um, let's say, for example, jalapeno, if the jalapeno got to that size, like I was still in the pot at that small, yeah, that would have been a that wouldn't have grown as well because of the small pot. Because um, these plants are much smaller, um, pot size wasn't that big an issue. Once they get bigger, yeah, so I'll transplant them into bigger pots. But because of the, their size are right now, I'm uh, worrying about the size of their pots isn't a big an issue. Awesome. Thank you very much.